Hi, I'm Pastor Sandy Benz from Hope Lutheran Church in Temecula, California. Welcome to our 8 a.m. worship service, which is our more traditional worship service. We also offer at 1015 Sunday mornings our more contemporary worship service. After their premieres on Sunday mornings, all of our worship videos are available on Hope's YouTube channel 24-7 for your viewing pleasure. If you'd like to share with us in Holy Communion, we encourage you to have bread, wine, or juice available with you in your worship area. Before we begin our worship this morning, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who sent cards and notes and uh, shared in the car parade that happened last Sunday afternoon. It was such a joy, such a surprise to have all of you share in the celebration of my 20th anniversary since I was ordained as a pastor in the ELCA. Um, I was surprised, I was filled with thankfulness at your kindness, and uh, I continue to give thanks for our partnership in sharing God's love, grace, and mercy with the world around us. And now we begin our worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and we rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us now live in hope. For hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen.
join our hearts in prayer. God of compassion, you have opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts that overflowing with joy, we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord of mercy, for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord of mercy, for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord of mercy, for this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord of mercy, help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the peace of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free. Chapter 19. The Israelites had journeyed from Rephedim, entered this wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. 
The people all answered as one, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And from Romans chapter five, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. according to Matthew chapter 9. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out the demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how, how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at the time. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
grace, mercy, and peace to you. From God, our Creator, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Jesus calls his disciples in today's gospel lesson, sending them out to proclaim the good news. But when we look at those he calls, it's hard not to notice that this group is not what we might call today a dream team. There's Peter, whose heart is in the right place, but who spends half his time rushing into things without thinking them through. There's Thomas, who always seems to be full of questions, wanting everything spelled out for him. There's Matthew, the tax collector, viewed with, by suspicion with many. And there's Judas Iscariot, who will betray Jesus. There are others whose stories we don't know, but they're all ordinary people, fishermen, tradesmen, farmers. They probably knew themselves well enough to realize they weren't up to the job that Jesus was calling them to. They weren't up to curing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, casting out demons. Oh, sure, Jesus, and what will we do after lunch, right? Still, perhaps, they thought to themselves they might be able to pretend as long as they went far enough away from home to a place where no one really knew them. Maybe they thought they might be able to maintain some facade, some holiness long enough to impress those that they landed amongst. But no such luck. Jesus is quite specific. They are not to go among strangers with their message. They're not sent in this instance to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans. It wasn't that Jesus had anything against these groups. He himself ministered to them. I think the point is that Jesus knew his disciples needed to start there at home with the people they knew. If their ministries were ever going to be rooted in reality, they needed to start right there where they were. Jesus calls them to a depth of genuine connection with the same people that we saw in Jesus' own ministry. When Matthew tries to describe how Jesus feels at the sight of the needy, ragged crowds that come to him, Matthew uses a Greek word that has to do with the gut. Jesus, he's saying, is sick to his stomach. Jesus feels the crowd's distress in his own body as if that distress were his own. If Jesus' followers can't make that same kind of connection with the people around them, if they are determined to do ministry at a safe distance, Jesus seems to know that they'll never have the empathy that they need to really help, to really make a difference. Jesus is calling his followers to a ministry that's rooted in genuine love, not in slick marketing. But how can they make that connection? Jesus tells them, you have received without payment, give without payment you have received. That, dear friends, I think is the important part. They themselves were in need and still are. And this is what Jesus wants them to remember as they deal with others who are also in need. It's not in their strength, but it's in their weakness. It's in their humility that they are most powerfully going to find and experience God's love 
that same love that they're being called to pass on, to share with others. Matthew describes the crowd that Jesus met, people just like they will meet, as harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. The image is a powerful one. The Greek word that's translated as harassed literally means coming to pieces, coming apart at the seams. And the world word helpless means tossed about. It's the image of a lamb that is caught in the jaws of some wild animal. That's what happened to sheep without a shepherd in Jesus' time. About 10 years ago, I was up at a kid's cancer camp in Central Valley, California. I had been invited to, to be with the kids and the campers and the counselors to pray and give a short talk with the kids before lunch. And then after lunch to just hang out, to visit with everyone that was there. It was a camp for kids who have cancer, who, kids whose lives have been affected by cancer. Maybe the death of a parent or maybe more than one parent. It's a chance at this camp for these kids to simply be kids, to have fun and laugh and play with others who know what it's like to have cancer be a part of your everyday life. The counselors who were working with the kids were in high school or college. Many had come back every summer, even planning their vacations or their summer jobs around being able to help with this very special camp each summer. Some of the young people, the leaders, had been asked by others, how can you do it? How can you be with kids who are sick, who are dying? What those questioning people didn't understand is that these young people knew they were answering a call. Many knew they were answering Jesus' call. They weren't helping from a distance. They were there up close, playing with, laughing, encouraging, even crying with really being with these kids. They felt these kids' pain in their guts. And they were forever changed by the experience of having interacted, spent time with these very special kids. These counselors and leaders had to tap into the hurting places in their own lives. They had to feel these kids' pain. And then they had to talk with them, interact with them from the place inside their very selves where they hurt so that they would have patience, that they would have empathy so they could love selfless, selflessly as they supported and came alongside these kids who had been through much. I think of those leaders now today as I look at the young people who are at work showing up and and speaking out in our communities across the U.S. The truth is that, that you and I are facing a time when so much in our lives, in our world, seems to be unraveling. Just as we thought we were coming out of the worst of the crisis with COVID-19, 
we found ourselves trying to wrap our brains around the protests of violence and what seems the never-ending discoveries of more evidence of racism, more examples of excessive force used against our brothers and sisters that up until now have not only been largely ignored, but even hidden from public scrutiny and accountability. As I have read and watched and observed over these last few weeks, I'm deeply concerned for our community, for our church, for our children, and for our grandchildren who are watching how we react to what's before us. How we react to debates over wearing masks, destruction of property and looting, videos that are showing excessive force that are resulting in great bodily damage or death. People of all races who have been united in cries for justice. Mourners across our country lined up to pay their respects to those mourning the murders of their loved ones. Make no mistake, our children and our grandchildren are watching us. They're watching to see if people in positions of responsibility are really willing to be honest about what's happening about what has happened. When people dare to say all lives matter, you and I actually know the facts don't match the motto. There is no white person that I know who would be willing to change places with a person of African descent. We know that black lives are tougher, that their families are under greater stress, greater discrimination, even facing greater danger than white families. Someone shared an example with me recently. They said in a neighborhood, all homes matter, and we agree with that. But if one home is threatened or on fire, that's the only one that matters. Until the fire is out and the threat to that one home is overcome. I have hope. Young people are showing up. They're doing the hard work of speaking up, of calling us to join in the work of making real change in ourselves and in our communities. They're calling us to work for what's in the best interest of all people, to work for the common good, not just what's in my or your best interests. It sounds a lot to my ears and my heart like Jesus' reminder of the two most important commandments God gives us to love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We have been commanded by God. We have been sent out as agents of God's love, grace, mercy, and we're called to begin at home, examining our own hearts. My truth is this. No matter how open-minded, how socially conscious, anti-racist I think I am, I still have old, learned, hidden biases that I need to examine. It is my responsibility to check myself daily for my stereotypes, for my prejudices, and ultimately for discrimination. I have a very limited understanding of what it means to be a person of color in our country, but I'm listening. 
I am learning, I'm reading, I'm talking with others, and I'm listening some more. I have a lot to learn and to unlearn. Thankfully, there are abundant resources to address my ignorance and the prejudices that sneak into my heart and my mind. After I do the work of examining my own heart, asking for God's forgiveness and help, then like Jesus' first disciples, you and I are sent out to connect with and talk with and listen to the people closest to us, our children and grandchildren, our family and friends, our neighbors, just down the block. Have you noticed that God chooses to work through us human beings? God brings about healing and justice and mercy and grace through us sent ones. The same ones, you know, who pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. God chooses to work through us, the same ones praying to learn how to forgive others as God forgives us. Jesus calls us to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Jesus is not calling us to be cynical. He wants us, like the serpent, to pay attention to what's going on around us. Of all creatures, the serpent is the most aware of, of his environment, the most sensitive to his surroundings, the most in touch with his circumstances. The serpent's entire body is a live wire of sensation. Jesus' followers are called to be aware, heads up, eyes open, senses on full alert to the needs around us. And Jesus calls us to be innocent as doves, not a pious innocence where we stick our heads in the stand. To be innocent as a dove is, is not to be naive or to live in denial. The dove is the symbol of God. Where there is a dove, there is to be found reconciliation, security, peace. Noah on the ark didn't get a weather report. He sent out a dove to see if it was okay to go back into the world. God's favor was shown in the descent of the dove at Jesus' baptism. The dove is no dumb bird. It's the sign of God's presence, the sign of God's power and grace and mercy, the power of God's ability to bring peace and shalom, wholeness through us human beings. You and I are the sent ones. We're invited by God to have the courage to engage in our local community, to be a voice of God's healing, an agent for God's reconciliation. We're called to pray for communities that are grieving wrongs after centuries of old wrongs and current experiences. We're called to pray for those who are faithfully and courageously serving and protecting our communities, as well as to pray for those who have suffered unjustly at the hands of those called to serve and protect. We're called to work together in building what Bishop Eaton called last Sunday, a color amazed community. The harvest is still plentiful the laborers are few, and probably if we have any sense at all, we are a bit wary of God's call. 
Who are we to think that we can do anything to change the world? Who are we to think we might cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, and work for justice? But just like Jesus' first disciples, we need to realize that Jesus is not calling us to have all of the answers. That won't help anyone. Jesus calls us to start right here at home. He calls us to look in the broken, battered places of our own lives, our own communities. He calls us to find God at work there and then to join God, to love God, to love others as Jesus loves us. Thanks be to God. Amen. vessels of God's redeeming word as God changes our hearts, our minds, as God knits us into one people. Let us together confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us together join our hearts in the prayers of God's people. Called together in the Spirit's embrace, let us pray for the mending of God's world. 
steadfast God. You are love and the source of all hope and courage. In these days when we are tempted to feel overwhelmed by the state of our world, remind us of your faithfulness. Overcome our fears and send your church as the laborers into your harvest. May we be instruments of your healing and wholeness, signs of your love and kingdom breaking forth in our homes, communities, and world. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Faithful creator, protect your earth. Where there is fire, bring cool air and new growth. Bring recovery after earthquake, flooding, drought, and other disaster. Inspire us to care for all you have created and entrusted to our stewardship. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Holy One, you have created us in your likeness and image, yet we deny the value and holiness of all your beloved children. Forgive our sin and transform our hearts. Lead us to reform and overturn the systems and institutions that leave some privileged at the expense of others. Make us bold in confronting the evil, injustice, and oppression that is literally killing your children. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Compassionate one, you bring us to yourself, caring for those who are harassed and helpless. Protect and defend those who are abused or suffer the violent consequences of racism, sexism, and ageism. Heal those who are sick and strengthen all who care for them. Feed all who hunger. Empower those whose voices go unheard and help us respond to the pressing needs of our neighbors. Hear the prayers we name silently or out loud right now. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of the ages, you call us to faithfulness and obedience as you send us out to discover new ways of living together in love. Hear our prayers, deepen our faith, help us build a world where all are dedicated to your glory and all are united and seeking our neighbor's good ahead of our own. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Living Lord, all who live and all who die belong to you. Thank you for all whose lives have witnessed to your glory. Sustain us in your mission until the day you bear us up to join the saints in light. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O oh God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time in our worship, we pause to share Christ's peace with one another. We do so turning to those we're worshiping with or perhaps later sharing a note or a call or a text message with others saying, may the peace of Christ be with you always. And then responding and also with you. Enjoy seeing some of the members of our Hope community sharing Christ's peace with you. May the peace of Christ be with you always and also with you. May the peace of Christ be with you always. From Marina and Mackenzie Wessel. Hi Hope family. May the peace of Christ be with you always. From the Ravel family. May the peace of Christ be with you always. From Brian, Sherry, Sherry, and Brooke. Brooke. Ito. Ito. May the peace of Christ be with you always. From Diane and Nick Anderson. May, May the, the peace of Christ, Christ be with you. 
from the home family, Suzanne, Eric, and Amanda. May the peace of Christ be with you from Roger Stroud. The peace of Christ be with you always from, from the Gallup family. family. May the, May the peace, peace of Christ be, be with, with you always. always. From Nolan, Jake, Justin, and Doreen. We give thanks to all of you for sharing your time, your talents, your financial gifts with Hope in support of Hope Ministries. It's because of your generosity that we're able to offer online worship and continue the ministries that uh, Hope is known for, including our upcoming online Vacation Bible School experience. If you haven't already given to Hope, we invite you to do so electronically. You can go to our website and follow the directions. You're also welcome to uh, send a check via snail mail and uh, let us know how we can be praying for you. Please join with me now in an a prayer of offering and thanksgiving. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are the signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. At this time, we invite you, if you'd like to share in a time of Holy Communion with us, to make sure you have bread, juice, or wine there in your worship area. If not, we invite you to share with us in a time of prayer during this time of communion. The Lord be with you and also with you. We lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God our thanks and praise. In the night before Jesus went to the cross for you and me, Jesus gathered with his disciples and there Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After they had eaten, Jesus took the cup. After I had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Drink of this, all of you in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim our Lord's life, his death, and his resurrection until he comes again. Remember us in your kingdom, Lord. Teach us to pray, saying from our hearts, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Take 
the bread and as we prepare to serve one another, as Jesus gives himself to us through the sacrament of Holy Communion, we remind one another, serving each other, saying, the body of Christ given for you. And serving one another, saying the blood of Christ shed for you. May these gifts of Jesus' body and blood strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. We give thanks for your unfailing presence and the hope you provide in times of uncertainty and loss. Send your Holy Spirit to enkindle in us your holy fire. Revive us to live as Christ's body in the world, a people who pray, worship, learn, break bread, share life, heal neighbors, bear good news, seek justice, rest and grow in the spirit. Wherever and however we gather, Unite us in common prayer and send us in common mission that we and the whole creation might be restored and renewed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. and the accompaniment of our Lord, who promises to be with us to the ends of the age. And now go in peace. Christ is with you. Remember the poor, heal the sick, and feed the hungry. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>